Welcome to our class track. This is track three, class number four, where we're going to be uh, talking tonight about overcoming the devil part two. Tammy taught overcoming the devil part one last week. And uh, in the spiritual growth progression, did she talk with you guys about where we're at in this? This is basically uh, most of the stuff that gets taught here on Sunday morning, not exclusively, but basically Sunday morning stuff. This napios, this part here, part two, uh, or actually it's uh, stage two of the spiritual growth, is what um, uh, we've been doing. We started last uh, at the beginning of the year with uh, the first track and the second track you've already been through. And so last week when Tammy started you began on this part, uh, the, the next stage of spiritual growth, Paydon, which is actually a spiritual adolescent. We're talking about overcoming the devil here. So you should be excited about that. Woohoo. Yeah. All right. So, so good. So uh, I want to talk with you. First of all, we're talking about overcoming the devil. And, I, and uh, I'm familiar with what Tammy taught you last week about overcoming the devil. And uh, we've, we talk a lot about overcoming Satan, that we have that Jesus died on the cross to give us authority over the devil, over sickness, disease, poverty, lack, discouragement, depression, despondency, gave us authority over our sin nature that we might be, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, that we might be, we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Uh, and the devil wants to stop that. The devil wants to stop your spiritual growth progression uh, when we began this class, we had a we have the center of the sanctuary was full. Yes. Now there are people that aren't here for legitimate reasons. I, you know, I was in the first part, but I can't be here because listen, I've been called out of town. They've changed my work hours. There are reasons why some people aren't here, but I, but I do also want you to understand that one of the reasons why people aren't here is because the enemy is out to stop your spiritual growth progression. He wants you to stay here. He wants the church to stay here. He doesn't want you to progress to here, doesn't want you to progress to here. And my goodness, he really doesn't want you to progress to here. Because this is where we actually figure out what's going on. This is where we're really doing damage to the enemy right here, is when we're mature adults. This is when, this is when we really get it that everything about church and everything about church life is not about us, but it's now about God. It's not that God's not going to minister to us and we can't worship and receive from God. At church, certainly we should. But then we kind of switch gears from that from, that, from the childhood mentality of who's going to feed me, who's going to take care of me, who's going to feed my diapers, or feed my who's going to change my diapers. I apologize on the film. We can't edit that out. You guys are going to have to deal with it. Uh, from, from that to, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the marks of being a mature adult is we want to have a family of our own. When you're this size and this size, you don't want to have kids. You want to be kids. But when you get to this point, now I want to have a baby. I want to have a start. I want to start a family. I want somebody else and somebody. Some, some people don't actually have babies. They have their dogs or their babies or their, there's something. I want something to take care of. And that's a side of maturity. I'm maturing to the point where I want to take some care of somebody else. Some people don't have babies. Their husbands are their babies. But I want to take care of somebody else. Got it? So um, let's talk about overcoming the devil. And I want to talk with you about two things tonight. First of all, I want to talk you, to you about Satan and why he is our adversary. Let's go to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. And we've got three scriptures here that are going to give us some insight into Satan and who he is and why he is our adversary. Satan is not just a bad guy with a bad attitude. You know, sometimes I read, I read about criminals and some of the things people do, and it's just like, wow, that guy just needs a mommy. That guy, that guy really needs, that guy just needs somebody to care about him. That, that guy's got a really bad attitude. But in the case of Satan, Satan is not just a bad guy who needs a mommy. Satan has a real history when it comes to the church. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. You got it? 
Um, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. You, Satan, shall be brought down to Sheol to the lower pits of the earth. Uh, the lowest depths of the pit. Now I want you to keep that in mind and I want you to go with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. It's on over, where were we? Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Ezekiel's two books over. Chapter 28, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11. You got it? In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11, here's more about Satan, uh, what the Bible says prophetically about, or actually looking back into Satan and who he was. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were... Now, there, there was a real king of Tyre, a real earthly king of Tyre. But this is an analogy for Satan, and I'll show you why it is. You were the seal of perfection. Well, we know that the king of Tyre was not the king of perfection. There's an analogy. I'm not going to go into the whole complete analogy uh, that goes on here, but uh, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, the king of Tyre was not in Eden, the garden of God. But guess who was? Satan was. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain with God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the Abundance of your trade. Well, let me stop right there. So this describes this with the scripture that we looked at before describes Satan and his history. Satan was actually a created angel. Um, he, he was not equal with uh, with Jesus. Sometimes people get get the misconception that uh, that the antithesis of Jesus is Satan. But you've got to realize that Jesus is God. Jesus has always been. He has no beginning and no end. And Jesus is God, the creator of the universe. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 14 tells us. Satan, on the other hand, is a created angel. But he was created, most scholars believe, and I tend to, to agree with that, that Satan was the worship leader in heaven. This says that he was covered with jewels. And then the workmanship in the last part of 13, it says the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day of, that you were created. Uh, most scholar believe, scholars believe what that means is that Satan was created with musical instruments built into him that he was a beautiful angel, that he was on the mountain with God, and that he led the heavenly choir, if you will. You know, all the singing that's going on in heaven, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, that Satan was actually this created angel who was the worship leader in heaven. So I always use the scripture to tell worship leaders, beware. Now, verse 16 says, interesting, it's interesting. It says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Satan traded the position that God gave him for a position that he wanted that God did not give him. Satan, the Bible describes Satan as deceiving a third of the angels in heaven and causing a rebellion in heaven. And how many of you know that rebelling against God is not a good idea? The only thing, uh, of course, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But, but when I think of Satan in heaven as the worship leader rebelling against God and turning a third of the angels against God, I, I, sort of, I sort of conjure up in my mind this image of Satan rebelling against God on his home turf. The only thing stupider than rebe rebelling against God on the earth is to be in heaven and do it. I mean, Really? So God, the Bible says that God threw Satan out of heaven along with the third of the angels that 
um, that rebelled with him and threw them to the earth. And so if you go ahead and read through 16, 17, 18, uh, verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. And it goes on and, and talks about Satan here. Uh, so God threw Satan down uh, on to the earth along with a third of the angels. And so then I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the first recorded occurrence of Satan's appearance on earth to human beings. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and God has placed them there to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then in verse 3, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, the serpent said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And this is Satan who is now, uh, he has either become a serpent or he has occupied the body of a serpent, and he is speaking to Adam and Eve through this serpent. And uh, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you even touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the, the eyes of, of them both were opened. And so what Satan did was tempt, Ad, tempt Eve first and then Adam. Uh, and there's a whole teaching here. We could spend the whole night just talking about Adam and Eve and he should have protected her and, and all of this. But what I want you to see is Adam in the, garden, in the garden. This is his first appearance on the earth. And he has been doing this ever since, tempting men, not just the, and the temptation, and I want you to get this very carefully, the temptation is not to do bad things. The temptation is not to be bad. The temptation is to rebel against the Word of God. God says do this, and He even has them rebelling against the Word of God when any idiot can see that the Word of God for them is good. I've given you this whole garden and everything in it. All they had to do was name animals and make babies. That's all they had to do. And they live in this beautiful garden. Everything's provided for them. They're all set up. And so what Adam and Eve did was really dumb. But what uh, Satan did was appeal to this nature that says, you don't have to listen to God. You can figure this thing out for yourself. This tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, God wanted to determine for Adam and Eve what was right and what was wrong. And Satan said, and by tempting them to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Satan is saying to Adam and Eve, you don't have to depend on God for that. If you eat of this tree, then your eyes will be opened and you can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. And men have been doing that ever since this happened. Uh, there's one scripture, I believe it might be um, um, First, the book of First Chronicles or Second Chronicles, one of them opens with the phrase, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's what, you know, a lot of the, the, uh, un, the lawlessness that we see on our earth today, some of it is because men are evil and they know it and they want to be evil. Some of it is because men are doing what they think is good. Let's take ISIS beheading people. Do you realize that they're doing that not because they think they're evil and they're serving the devil. They're doing that because they think they're the servants of God. And that's a direct result of what you see right here. Rather than God dictating to them what is right and wrong, every man is determining what's right in their own eyes. Now something that, um, so this is the appearance of Satan on the earth. And this is the, um, this is the, uh, this is what Satan's, uh, this is what Satan's trying to do in your life now. It's not that, you know, uh, years ago I'm going to date myself. I realize most of you would not realize that I was 60. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to date myself. But there used to be a television program 
uh, that starred Flip Wilson when I was a kid. And he would do something or say something wrong, and he'd always look into the camera and say, well, the devil made me do it. But it was, it was attached to these different acts that he did. He would, he would say this, he would slip and say this, or slip and say that, and, and do this, and he would say, the devil made me do it, referring to the specific act. But we as Christians need to realize that the devil is not out to get you to sin, a particular sin. The devil's not out to get you to cuss. The devil's not out you, to get you to, I mean, cussing's not good. But that's not what the devil's trying to do. The devil's not trying to get you to take a drink. The devil's not trying to get you to, to, to do one particular action. The devil's trying to get you to rebel against God. God says, this is what I want you to do. And the devil's trying to get you to think for yourself to the point that you say, you know what, I'm not going to do this God's way. I can figure this out on my own. Or, the de or God says, I don't want you to do this. No, I think I can figure this out. I, no, I think actually I think I will. Do that even though God doesn't want me to. This is, this is what the devil's trying to do in your life. So now I want to talk with you about overcoming the enemy and kind of piggyback off of what Tammy taught so well last week. Tammy taught you this last week. Our arsenal against the devil, five things. The name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church. Our arsenal, those five things are our arsenal against the devil to keep us in the will, plan, and purpose of God. The name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church. Everybody got that? You got that last week, didn't you? But, but I want to really pinpoint on something tonight. And that is that all of these things operate by the power of words. All these things operate by the power of words. I wish, I have asked the Holy Spirit several times at the beginning of certain years, could I teach the whole year, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, leadership update, cell groups, elders meetings, leadership uh, uh, staff meetings, could I teach the whole year just on the power of words? Could I teach like 400 messages this year on the power of words? And I haven't ever, I haven't ever gotten the release to, to teach all the time on that. And I don't know if the church would tolerate that. I mean, after about three months, it would be, a, you know, if that's all we're going to talk about. Uh, but it's, it's hard to get Christians to understand how important this subject is. All these things, the power of the name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the church, all of these operate by words. There's a lot of teaching in this church about words. A lot of teaching. We talk about it almost every message. I talk about the power of words and the power of our confession. I'm not going to teach on the power of your confession. I'm not going to teach on how words work here. In fact, uh, some people will minimize the strength of a CD series that I have that we use here, that we give to newcomers, simply because we give it to newcomers. People think, well, if we, they're giving it away, you know, how good can it be if you're giving it away? Anybody else think, I think that when people are saying, we're giving this away for free, I'm thinking, so now how good can that be if it's going to be free? Um, we're giving that to newcomers because it may be the best series I have. Words. They got you into this, they can get you out. And that is a great practical teaching on how words work and how to implement words in your life. I'm not going to teach on that tonight, but um, I do want to say a, a few things about this. First of all, most Christians don't actually understand how important words are in overcoming the enemy. Words are vital to the importance of overcoming the enemy. You will not, you will not, say it with me, I will not, you will not overcome the power of the enemy if your words don't line up with the word of God. It won't happen. You can beg, you can plead, you can call in, you can cast out, you can do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, until your words line up with the word of God and God's will and God's plan, until your words line up, you will never overcome that 
power of the enemy in your own life. To many people, the power of the spoken word, is it's magic. Once people get this whole idea of, oh, he's talking about words and the power of words, and now we got a promise book. You know, every, every household needs to have a copy of God's promises for your every need. And, but people get that, and they think, oh, it, it sort of sounds like magic to them, like, uh, like getting a spell book. You know, you want, you want, uh, you, 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 your boyfriend dumped you, and so you want to, you really want to get back at him. So you get a, uh, you get a spell book on how to put a curse on your boyfriend. And then, so then you read this little thing right here and you got a, uh, you know, you got a, a bottle of this and a box of that and, and a, and a, and a little teaspoon of stump water and all this stuff. And then you make this incantation and bad things happen to your boyfriend. Now I know that sounds gross as weird to some of you, but some people treat the word of God like that, like it's magic. Once they find out the power of the spoken word works, then they're using these incantations from the Bible like magic. But what we have to realize, what keeps us out of that is when we realize that the whole kingdom of God, in fact, the whole universe operates on the power of words. So it's not just okay, uh, once a month when I'm mad at somebody, once a month when a sickness attacks me, once a month when I get my uh, bank statement and I realize financially I'm not doing really well, then I'm going to get the Bible out and I'm going to quote a few scriptures and turn that around. That's not, what the, that's not what this whole thing is about. Your life operates on a principle of words. And where you're at in your life right now is the sum total of the words that you've been speaking over your life all these years. You are where you said you would be. Because it's a life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So um, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 1 We've talked about this before, but in Hebrews chapter 1, go with me to Hebrews 1 for just a second. Hebrews chapter 1. It's in the back of your Bible right before Hebrews, is right before James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. So it's right there. Hebrews chapter 1. Everything, the whole universe operates on the power of words. I could, when, when I was talking about teaching on, you know, asking the Holy Spirit, could I actually have a whole year where I could teach on words? I want you to listen to me very carefully. I could teach on words every single Sunday morning, teach a different message every single Sunday night, teach a different message every single Wednesday night, and then teach the staff and leadership update. I could teach on words for a whole year what the Bible says about it and not repeat a single message. I could do 300 different messages on words because the Bible is full of it. The whole kingdom of God operates on the principle of words. So the reason that I'm talking about this is because the subject matter is how to overcome the enemy. And until you grasp this and you understand the power of your words that your whole life centers on the words that you speak. Until you get that, uh, what Tammy taught last week, as vital as it is, it's not going to operate into your life until you realize, i got to get a hold of my words, not just the bad words, not just the good words. Sometimes people, oops, I should, I'm, oops, I made a negative confession, oops, because they're talking about one single incident where they said something they shouldn't have said. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that moment by moment, your whole life is propelled into the future or held back from your future by your words. So everything that you say, everything you say to other people, everything that you say over your life, everything that you say to your boss, everything that you say to yourself on the way to work, everything that you say is moving your life in one direction or the other. It's vital. Um, Hebrews 1, chapter 1 through 3, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also, through his Son Jesus, through whom he also made the worlds, through Jesus. Who being the, express, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and he, Jesus, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And I love some of the other translations. The Amplified Bible says, says in verse 3 that Jesus is guiding and propelling the universe by the words of his power. 
The Message Bible says that Jesus holds everything together by what he says. So we know in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, let there be light, and there was light. And he said, let there be a firmament, and there was a firmament. And so for six days, Jesus spoke, and the worlds were created. We know that. But what Hebrews 1.3 tells us is that today, right now, Jesus is guiding and propelling the universe. And he is holding everything together today with his words. So Jesus is still operating in this. He was at the beginning of time. Let there be light. And then all the way through the, uh, the Israel's uh, journey through the wilderness, he's trying to get them to to learn how to, to speak, how to, how to say, say things. And we talked about that in here before, about Moses striking the rocks instead of speaking to it. And then even in the New Testament, the disciples are following Jesus, and Jesus is trying to get them to learn how to speak and get things to happen when they speak. And we, and we talk about a lot of this on Sunday morning, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But I want to I uh, finish up with this. Why our words are important in overcoming Satan. Remember the five things that I said, our arsenal against the devil, the name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church. All of these operate by words. First of all, the name of Jesus. The power of the name of Jesus spoken. In Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her master as much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Paul didn't just think that this spirit should come out. He spoke to it, and he spoke the name of Jesus. So the name of Jesus is to be spoken, not just believed in. We all believe in the name of Jesus, but the name of Jesus is to be spoken, not just as a cute ending to our prayers, not just, a, just, not just an ending when we're asking the blessing. We teach our kids how to ask the blessing and be sure you say, you know, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, that's, we should teach our kids to do that. But we got to realize that when you say the name of Jesus, there is power in that name. And demons bow their knee to the name of Jesus, Philippians chapter 4 says. So first of all, there's the name of Jesus. Then second of all, the word of God. In Matthew 8, 5 through 13, a centurion comes to Jesus because his servant is sick, and Jesus says, well, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion says, well, you don't have to come and, see him. come and heal him. You don't have to come to my house. I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house. If you will speak the word from this distance, my servant will be healed. And so there's the spoken word name of Jesus, and then there's the spoken word of God that overcomes the power of the devil. Then there's the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24 tells us that the blood of Jesus speaks. Listen to this. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See, how many of you remember the story of Cain and Abel in the Bible where Cain was jealous of Abel and Cain killed Abel? And when God then confronts Cain over what he's done, how does God know that Abel is dead? Well, of course, God knows everything. But one of the interesting things that God says to Cain is Abel's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Wow. Wow. Abel's blood is crying out. That's how I know Cain said, how do you know I did anything wrong? Because I can hear Abel's blood crying out to me from the ground, and Abel's dead. And here it says that the blood of Jesus, uh, that's what it's referring to when it says the blood of Jesus, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel, the blood of Abel that's crying out from the ground. So even the blood of Jesus speaks. Uh, number four, the Holy Spirit. 
The power of the Holy Spirit is spoken. It's spoken. It's not, the Holy Spirit is not just to be, and I, and I want you to get this, the Holy Spirit is not just to be believed in, but the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is to be prayed in. It's called praying in the Spirit. Having your prayer language. One of the most powerful things that you will ever do next to your salvation, being baptized in the Holy Spirit and having your prayer language is one of the most important things that's going to happen to you. And when you do that, for example, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, it says, He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. And in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. So here again, we, we see this in the Holy Spirit that we're speaking. We're not just thinking in the Holy Spirit. We're not just believing in the Holy Spirit. We're not just experiencing the Holy Spirit. We're not just in a church service and we can feel the Holy Spirit. But we're speaking. Everybody say speaking. speaking. We're speaking in the Holy Spirit. You see the power of words, the power of words in the uh, with the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus, the Word of God, and then finally the church. Watch this. In Matthew 16, 15 through 18, Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to Simon, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Watch this. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock of the confession that you have just made, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is built on a confession of God's word. You can't get away from this speaking, the, the, the kingdom of God being built on speaking and operating on the power of the spoken word. You can't get away from it. The church is built on the power of the spoken word. The blood of Jesus operates by the power of the spoken word. The Holy Spirit operates by the power of the spoken word. The word of God operates by the power of the spoken word. And your words propel you in your future or will hold you back from your future. And so you're never going to defeat the enemy in your life, in your family, in your situation until you get a hold of not of, of understanding that your words, the words that you speak are not just an event. And oops, I let my, you know, sometimes people get a, uh, they'll get, because when they get around the pastor, um, you know, it's not good to say things like, wow, that scared me to death. And when you, you know, if somebody says that, you're not going to, I don't believe you're going to fall down dead if you say that but you will create an atmosphere of death around you when you used to you know, that, you know you know i just love her to death you know i had a guy come up to or a lady come up to me you know i just your preaching is so good i just love you to death please don't love me to death <laughs> love me love my preaching but don't love me to death please. i didn't say that to her she's a young christian new christian i didn't say that to her i was honored that she and i didn't fall down dead when she said that but you create an atmosphere around yourself with the words that you use. And so sometimes people will be around the pastor and they'll let something slip and they'll say, wow, that, you know, that just thrilled me to death. Oops, pastor, I, I, I shouldn't have said that, should I? And they don't realize I'm not concerned about a word event like that. I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about what are you surrounding your whole life with? What's your, what's your whole life uh, What's, what's your whole life like? What are, you, what are you building around your whole life? Not just, not just that one thing. That's, that's not a big deal. Jesus' whole ministry was based on the words that he spoke that began in our Bible. Now, remember, Jesus has always been. Jesus is God. He is not a created being. Jesus has always been. You know what? If you want something that will keep you up all night, as you're going to sleep tonight, think about how long Jesus has been alive and how long Jesus will be alive because Jesus has no beginning and no end. So after 100 billion, trillion, zillion years, Jesus is, he's, he, he was here 1 billion, zillion, trillion years before that. And one billion, zillion, trillion years before that. It has no beginning. I did that one time. That's not fun. That'll hurt your head. 
<laughs> that was not a good confession, but it will. Jesus' whole ministry was based on the words that he spoke that in our Bible began in Genesis with the worlds being spoken into existence. Let there be light and there was light is the first occurrence in our Bible of Jesus speaking. And then he spoke and he spoke and he spoke here and he spoke here and he spoke there and he spoke there all through the, I'm not to the New Testament yet, in the Old Testament. He spoke here and he spoke this and he spoke that and he spoke this into existence. And then he gets to the New Testament. He's walking in the, on the earth and he's got the, the 12 wise guys with, I mean the 12 disciples with with him and he's trying to get them to see what guys you got to watch this i'm going to speak to this fig tree watch watch what happens watch guy hey, peter over here peter come here watch watch i'm going to speak to this fig tree watch what happens and he curses the fig tree he says okay guys well, let's go well, we didn't see anything so they come back the next day the thing's dead in one day and the disciples are going, wow, that was amazing and jesus says okay now that i got your attention let me talk to you about you if you say to that mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say will come to pass, you will have, you will have whatever you say, just like what you saw me do. And Jesus spent his whole ministry on the earth speaking. A lot of people are real, Jesus did some amazing miracles, and pretty much the miracles that Jesus did were because of what he spoke, what he spoke. Jesus spoke to the fig tree. He spoke to the spirit. He spoke to the blind man. He spoke to Judas. He spoke to Satan. He spoke to the paralytic. He spoke to the dead girl. He spoke to the lame man. He spoke to the man with the withered hand. He spoke to unclean spirit, he, spirits. He spoke to the legion of demons. He spoke to the woman who was bleeding. He spoke to the wind and the sea, and he spoke to Lazarus in the grave. He spoke to them. Wow, Jesus brought Lazarus up from the dead. He spoke to him. Wow, Jesus calmed the wind. And sometimes we get, we get, you know, Jesus calmed the wind and the sea. He spoke to it. Everything Jesus did, he spoke to it. So I want to leave you with this idea that you've got to get a hold, not of your individual, oops, I've got a phrase in my vocabulary. Yeah, Pastor Steve, okay, I, I'm not going to raise, don't ask us to raise our hands, but you've decided, wow, well, I hope Pastor Steve never hears me say that thrilled me to death. Be careful that you're just focusing on, you know, I want to change that piece of my vocabulary. We got to change our whole vocabulary. We got to change our whole life to realize that our words propel us into the future. All of your words, everything you say about your job, about your marriage, about your life, uh, about your health, about your finances, everything you say in your life propels you toward your future or keeps you from it. And when the battle gets the worst, is when we're tempted to have a bad attitude and say the wrong things, and that's when you need it the most. When it doesn't seem to be working, that's when you need it the most. When you're tempted to think, this confession thing doesn't work. I mean, I've been speaking to this, and it's, it's this is, you know. I've spoken to things, and, they ha and the exact opposite happened of what I said. The exact opposite. I, know, I don't mean it's going to turn around. I mean the exact top is it happened and it's done. There's, and there's nothing that I can do about it. And see, when the enemy can get in and cause those kinds of things to happen, he's after your confession. He's after your words. He's trying to get you to renege on this whole idea of. I talked to somebody the other day that, that told me, yeah, you know, I used to go to a word of faith church. I used to do this word stuff and all the speaking you all do. I don't do that anymore. I didn't get in an argument with them. I just realized there's somebody, the enemy got to them. Discouraged them here. This didn't happen. That didn't happen. This didn't go the way they thought. This didn't work out. You know, whatever. And the enemy is going to try to do that for you as much as he can until you just finally give up. This doesn't work. Well, it worked for Jesus. And Jesus told his disciples, if you'll do this, it'll work for you. So I'm going to side with Jesus, not with a person who's gotten discouraged. That's good. So... Um, my, I want to leave you with this thought. What are you speaking to in your life? What are you speaking to in your life? What needs your words to? What mountains need to move? They're not going to move because you pray, because you whine, because we cry, because somebody feels sorry for us, because somebody bails us out. God doesn't even feel sorry for us. It moves because we speak to it. And we believe that what we say will come to pass. Everybody say, what I say, what I say will, come will come to pass. Um, I'm trying to find a stopping place. I want, uh,
because I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, just be sure that you're not, that you're not caught up in, and, and you hear this on Sunday morning, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but when people read that scripture in Mark 11, 23 and 24, where it says, uh, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass. What that scripture does not say that you have to believe that the mountain will move. It says that you have to believe that what you say will come to pass. So we got a lot of people trying to believe in the, they're trying to believe, I'm trying to believe for my healing. I'm speaking and I'm trying to believe that my healing will happen. I'm trying to believe that my finances will straighten out. I'm trying to believe that my marriage will go better. I'm trying to believe that. You don't believe, that's not what you believe. What you believe is that what I say will come to pass. Everybody locking into this? That's what you got to believe. You don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to believe that my healing is going to occur. I have to believe that what I say will come to pass. What I say, and once you get that in your head, then you realize, well, now I need to surround myself with, with powerful words and the word of God because what I say is going to come to pass. Everybody say, what I say, what I say. Will, come will come to pass. Will come to pass. Will come to pass. And that's what you have to believe. Not that the mountain will move. Not that the healing will take place. Not your marriage is going to be healed. Not that, not that you know, the job opening is going to happen. You know, I'm trying my best to believe that, that I'm trying to believe that this job is mine. That's not what you have to believe. You have to believe that what you say will come to pass. Good. Once you believe that, number one, you're going to start speaking to mountains. But also, it will keep you from saying things that you shouldn't say once you, once you realize what I say will come to pass. Well, I don't want to say that. I love you to death. And what I say will come to pass. Y'all okay? Well, I sure hope, wow, we're, we're, flying to, we're flying to Africa, Connie and I are in November. I sure hope I don't get Ebola. See, I mean, yeah, I hope I don't bring it back here and give it to everybody else. You know, you start saying that kind of stuff and you, you create an atmosphere around yourself with your words. I believe that what I say will come to pass. So when I get on that plane, when I get on that plane, everybody on there is safe. Because right. I'm on there. Right. Wow, you're awfully cocky, aren't you? I mean, you know, who do you think you are? I'm just, it's not me. It's, I believe that what I say will come to pass. Do you believe that? What you say will come to pass. And so, so what are you speaking to in your life? What needs to happen to your li in your life? And what are you speaking to? Pay attention to your words. This is not a novelty. This is how the kingdom of God works. It's not a novelty. This is not an extra added attraction. This is not an option for people that want to go to Word of Faith churches as opposed to, opposed to Baptist churches. It's not an option. This is how the kingdom of God works, whether you're a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever you are. This is how the word works. Okay?